Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this call today on Clostridioides difficile infections, or CDIs, and Destiny Pharma's NT-CDM3 product. My name's Andy Smith, and it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Dale Girding, research physician at Heinz VA Medical Center, consultant and advisory board member to Destiny Pharma, a company I've known and uncovered as an analyst for equity development for a number of years. Professor Girding is a long-standing expert and researcher on Clothridioides difficile, whose achievements were recently recognized uh, by a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, of the C. difficile Society. Professor Girding, congratulations on that award and, and welcome to our discussion today. Thank you, Andy. Much appreciated. So I'd like to start <laughs> off for our, for our viewers and if they're listening, listeners, uh, um, background with a, with a short history on uh, CDIs or Clostridioides difficile infections, because it's all changed since I were, first worked in the clinical microbiology lab in the 1980s. Back then, we, we would be infrequently asked to culture a stool for something that was then called Clostridium difficile from patients with a presumed diagnosis of what was then pseudomembranous colitis or PMC, and it's now called Clostridioides difficile and, and Clostridioides difficile infections. So both names have changed and I'm still getting used to it. Uh, and so is the prevalence of the disease. So could you bring us up to date, Professor Girding, with what's happened with CDI in, the, in those years, uh, why they occur and in what sort of patients they seem to occur in? The um, discovery of uh, Clostridium difficile as the cause of pseudomembranous colitis occurred in uh, the late 1970s. And so through the 1980s, we knew how to treat this infection very early on with the use of vancomycin and then, the, <coughs> excuse me, the development of uh, metronidazole as a treatment agent as well. And, and most um, hospitals and healthcare systems were not aware of C. diff as, as a significant healthcare problem until about the year 2000, when disease cases started to really accelerate in the United States. And at that point in time, uh, we, our laboratory was taking samples from a number of different hospitals around the country and having the same organism causing outbreaks of, of C. diff. And we were typing these organisms and then uh, CDC was having the same experience, the Centers for Disease Control in the US, and we collaborated with them and were able to show that there was a new strain of Clostridioides difficile, then called Clostridium difficile, circulating in the United States and causing a very high rate of infection, very high mortality and very high morbidity, and particularly involving elderly patients. And uh, this became apparent in 2005 when it was published in the New England Journal, but shortly thereafter, outbreaks in Canada and in the UK uh, documented the same organism uh, spreading to multiple locations around the world and eventually uh, throughout Europe and even into Asia. And this organism really put uh, C. diff on the map in terms of a healthcare infection. So uh, in terms of uh, CDIs or C. diff infection, how do patients get, get the disease, Professor Gerding? Well, it's, um, it's an interesting disease in that uh, normally uh, with an infection, you get the infection first and then you get treated with antibiotics. In this case, uh, you get treated with antibiotics for an infection and then you get C. diff because the antibiotics in the process of treating your infection also disrupt your normal bacteria in your colon. And when they do that, you become susceptible to infection by uh, Clostridioides difficile. And if you happen to ingest the spores of, the, of the, that bacteria, uh, you potentially will become very ill with severe diarrhea, abdominal pain, even uh, shock and potentially even death. Um, so it's, um, it's an interesting disease in that it, it requires first that you have some disruption of your normal bacteria before you're susceptible to, uh, to becoming infected by it. And, and antibiotics are the most 
common reason for disruption of the microbiota. But um, some other drugs, chemotherapeutic agents, for example, also can do this, as well as uh, proton pump inhibitors, uh, which are pretty commonly taken. And, and they actually have antibiotic activity as well. And, and how do patients present with a disease? What, what, what do that? I, I mean, di diarrhea, I think, is rumored to be the, the most common uh, uh, sign, but th there are other, is there abdominal pain? What, what have, how do the patients feel? Yes, there's abdominal pain, cramping, uh, many times high frequency of, of diarrheal events in a day, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 events per day. Uh, people can become uh, hypotensive, uh, go into shock. Um, and those are the most extreme cases, but it varies quite widely. So some patients just have mild diarrheal illness. Others will have extremely severe uh, symptoms. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to move on, <laughs> Professor Gurdy, now to the clinical and commercial significance of of CDIs, because you actually mentioned that there's mortality associated with disease. Um, and in, in my investment research, when I write on Destiny Farmer, I noted, a, I think you mentioned it, a 2015 New England Journal of Medicine paper that on the burden of CDIs in the US, and it estimated the number of incident CDIs at something like 453,000, number of first recurrences at 83,000, and the number of deaths at around 29,000. Is, is that still right, Professor Gooding? That's um, uh, data from uh, the year 2011 published in 2015. There's, there's been a more recent report from CDC published in 2020. The number of cases is still very high at 462,000. And I think there's about 70,000 recurrences and the um, Mortality is about uh, 20,500 right now. So it's, it's still very high. It's declined a bit, uh, largely because the epidemic strain that had caused so much trouble in the early 2000s is now starting to uh, reduce in numbers in hospital in the United States, which is good news uh, for patients. And is that the same epidemic strain that had uh, or was that was not responsive one way or another to metronidazole uh, therapy, because I think it's gone out of fashion, isn't it? Um, it, it was one of the uh, reasons that metronidazole therapy probably started to fail because of this particular strain. Uh, metronidazole was not an ideal treatment agent to begin with, even though we were among our group, the first to publish that, that it was effective back in the early 1980s. But uh, subsequently in, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, report, increasing numbers of reports of clinical failure, not, not particular resistance to the drug, but just clinical failures uh, became much more frequent. And this is related to the ribotype 027 or what's called in the United States NAP1 or in our laboratory, we call it the BI strain. So uh, it's all the same. And uh, fortunately it, it is, uh, uh, decreasing in frequency in the United States and in Western Europe, but still quite common in Eastern Europe. And, and I believe the, the US CDC has suggested that uh, CDIs are the most frequent hospital acquired infection. And that's a significant healthcare burden if the CD, CDC says that. Why don't we hear more, hear more about CDIs then? Well, it, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, I think um, the nature of the disease process causing diarrhea may be one of the factors that uh, keep people from talking about it all that much. It's not a great dinner conversation subject. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 until the CDC finally published uh, uh, five or so years ago that, that C. diff was really the most common healthcare associated infection, I don't think people really appreciated it. And many hospitals for many years were not testing for it. Uh, and that's another reason that it went undetected, basically. <clears throat> I guess uh, many viewers outside the US may not know that as a hospital acquired infections, infection, US hospitals are sometimes or often financially penalized for infections that are acquired in hospitals. So 
I'm assuming not only are our CDIs uh, an unmet clinical need, but they could potentially affect the profitability of, of hospitals in the US, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, so the U.S. monitors uh, C. diff rates uh, on an annual basis, and if you fall below a certain level for expected rates for your size hospital, you can be penalized. And I, I tend to think of of CDIs as a hospital acquired infection, um, but I also remember in the past people talked about. MRSA being a hospital acquired infection and then being a, moving to be acquired in the community. Do, do uh, CDIs ever uh, originate in the community? Well, it turns out that uh, more and more cases are being found in the community. And um, when I first started work in this area, 90% uh, of all C. diff cases were occurring in hospital. And we felt there was very little C. diff in the community. Subsequently, uh, medical care has shifted markedly over the years and has gone from an inpatient procedure to an outpatient procedure in many cases. So we have outpatient surgeries, we have uh, outpatient dialysis. Uh, all of these healthcare uh, activities are now on, ongoing in the outpatient setting. And so we're starting to see many more cases of C. diff. To, currently in the US, approximately half of cases are in outpatients and half are in inpatients. Right, it depends what you mean by hospital acquired, I guess. Oh, I thought of a new acronym, um, transitory inst institutionalized infections or something like that, which will cover outpatients, <laughs> I guess. Anyway, if we could, uh, if we could move on to then um, uh, a broader discussion of, of why C CDIs actually happen and an introduction to this new science, which is new since my time as a training as a microbiologist, the, the microbiome. Um, and, and the microbiome has, uh, people tell me, has risen in, in prominence as an area of study. Um, and uh, uh, if I could offer a few words of, of definition of the microbiome, perhaps, and Professor Gerdy, you could correct me, it, it would... Uh, our microbiomes are what classical microbiologists like me used to call the normal flora of various parts of our anatomy, like the oral cavity or the skin or, or the lower bowel. And as separate microbial ecosystems, they have a role in the prevention of disease. Is that reasonable for a, a, a broad discussion of, of the microbiome, Professor Gurney? Sure, I think so. And uh, we're particularly focused on the microbiota of the colon. Uh, the large bowel, which uh, is loaded with different uh, kinds of bacteria. And there are more uh, uh, bacterial genomes than, than there are genes in the human body. So we, we uh, really have a, a massive number of bacterial organisms um, and viral organisms and fungal organisms uh, that we share uh, the environment of our gut with. And, and uh, I guess many many of us, or most of us, don't understand the complexities, as you were hinting, of, of the interaction between our, our, the microbiome, or the species that can, can comprise the microbiome, and conversely then, the disruption of, of in this case, the lower bowel microbiome, microbiome causes disease, diarrhea, CDIs, and then interventions that uh, are, are now or aimed, even the, the antibiotics were aimed at restoring that normal bio microbiome and, and, and they resulted in a number of new and potential therapies uh, from companies like Destiny Pharma, for example. And that right, I, th I think uh, the, the important um, disease process that's going on that requires restoration of the microbiota is that C. difficile has a very high rate of recurrence. So when it's successfully treated, um, it, it's relatively easy to stop the diarrhea with another antibiotic. But in experience uh, uh, of large numbers of patients, we find that between 20 and 30% of them will have a recurrence of the same diarrhea episode again uh, following treatment. And this has now become the major target of microbiome restoration, or in the case of uh, non-toxigenic C. diff M3, which uh, we'll talk about, uh, here we are trying to replace the toxigenic strain of C. diff 
with a non-toxigenic harmless strain and thereby prevent further recurrences, uh, but with a little different mechanism. So rather than try to restore the microbiota, uh, as is being done with say fecal microbiota transplants, we are going to focus on replacing the toxic strain, replacing it with a harmless strain and letting the microbiota recover on its own, which it does. So before we get to talking about the current standard of care and then the future standard of care that includes Destiny Farmers M3, and this, I'd like to get your view on, on the, the point of recurrences with patients, because this is, this is unusual amongst bacterial infections, isn't it? I mean, you don't expect most bacterial infections once they're treated to recur. What, what are recurrences correlated with, Professor? Well, we think that uh, the problem is largely around the method we're using to treat the infection, which is another antibiotic. And we know that that antibiotic is going to have additional effects unintended on the microbiota and, and cause it to be disrupted further. When that happens, that means that the patient remains susceptible to another uh, C. diff recurrence and those recurrences um, are generally caused by the same bacterial organism that, that caused the original infection. Excuse me. <clears throat> the, um, the rate of recurrence is, um, is really quite high with traditional treatments like vancomycin and metronidazole in the 20 to 30% range. And the... Um, the recurrences uh, usually are happen very quickly. They're within two or three weeks. Uh, the majority of them have occurred in the patient. And once you have one recurrence, you're more susceptible to a second and a third recurrence. And some patients have had uh, recurrences uh, three, four, five, six times uh, without successful management. And so the focus of treatment now is on trying to reduce these recurrences, eliminate them if possible. And we know that antibiotic therapy alone is not going to be sufficient to do that. Although the narrower the spectrum of an antibiotic treatment, the better it will be at preventing recurrence. But we know that antibiotics are critical for treatment, but we're going to have to do something else to try to prevent recurrence. Mm. And uh, we talked about um, a, a void that, that re re represents the current or difference between the current standard of care and what, be, what would be the ideal standard of care for, for CDIs. But if we can talk about the current standard of care for a moment, um, uh, we, we, your, your presentation at the recent uh, CDIF conference um, talked about the safety and the efficacy of various experimental therapies, as well as the, the antibiotics that, that currently used. And also you've mentioned fecal microbiota transplantations, FMTs. They're often uh, more, more common outside the US than they are. Um, and you've also mentioned that antibiotics are used in the first instance for that first uh, or that first infection. But th there's th th that aspect is they're not the only therapies. The antibiotics that are first line are not the only therapies. There are later line therapies potentially that are currently approved, uh, but very expensive, right? Right. So um, there are two approaches to trying to reduce recurrence. One is uh, if you could find an antibiotic that would treat the initial infection, but not disrupt the normal microbiota, that would in itself reduce recurrence. And one of the drugs that's available currently, fidaxomycin, actually has a lower recurrence rate of about 15%. Uh, there are new drugs under development. Uh, ritonilazole is one of them, uh, whose phase two trial suggested that it might also uh, be effective in terms of reducing recurrence. So, uh, but, but it still is not zero, it's still 15%. So the alternative approach is antibiotics plus some adjunctive agent or add-on therapy. And those add-ons, you mentioned uh, monoclonal antibody, bezlotuximab, which is on the market currently. And it acts by inducing a antibody to the toxin B of 
Clostridium difficile. It is a targeted antibody specific for toxin B. Has to be given intravenously, uh, must be given during the time of antibiotic therapy, and uh, is effective probably for uh, months to up to a year. Um, it, since it is a mono, we're hearing a lot about monoclonal antibodies as part of COVID treatment. Mm -hmm. And, and this is a monoclonal that's been on the market since uh, about 2018. So we, we've now established that void between, uh, a void of unmet clinical need, if you like, between first line antibiotics for that first case. And then for those patients who have multiple recurrences, you know, a, a very expensive branded antibiotic or, or a very expensive monoclonal antibody. And with, the, with that backdrop of an unmet clinical need in, in, in CDIs, how did you then go about discovering the, your the non-toxigenic Clostridioides difficile M3 strain that's been developed by by uh, Destiny Pharma? We um, actually discovered it in, uh, under a research grant uh, from the Department of Veterans Affairs in the U.S. Uh, I worked in a, a Veterans Affairs hospital, and uh, we were sampling patients' stool either with uh, stool cultures or rectal swabs, looking for acquisition of C. difficile in the stool, uh, trying to figure out how they were getting it and, uh, and how frequently they were getting it in hospital. And to our surprise, we, we started to uh, look at these strains that we were recovering from the stool and found that about 40% of them were actually non-toxigenic. They, they did not produce the toxins A and B that are normally responsible uh, for C. diff diarrhea. Uh, at the time, we didn't even know about binary toxin, which is a third toxin, uh, but these strains also do not have binary toxin. And we uh, had developed at the time a typing system, which enabled us to distinguish one uh, non-toxigenic strain from another. And when we did that, we found that there were certain strains that were very common in terms of colonizing these patients. And uh, that was a tip off, I think, that uh, there probably were characteristics of these strains that made them very good at colonizing patients. And once colonized with these strains, they did not get C. diff symptoms. They were not subsequently infected with C. diff. Earlier studies uh, in the UK by Peter Borealo, in the US by Ken Wilson, had found similar protection in animal studies in the hamster model, but they weren't durable. They did not uh, persist in terms of uh, protection of these animals. And so when we found these strains and were able to type them, uh, we took them into the animal model and found that as opposed to previous observations, these strains were durable. They were protective against disease in the hamster model and persisted in terms of protection for months and months in these animals. So it, it, you are describing what's coming close to a, a perfect treatment for CDIs that fills that void, uh, a, a naturally occurring non-toxigenic strain that persists for a period of time that excludes toxigenic strains coming in. So it's, it's almost the ideal microbiome product, isn't it? Well, I think so. And, and in fact, it, it does not permanently alter the microbiota, it, uh, it disappears uh, the, in the phase two trial that was done, uh, the longest that any strain of uh, non-toxigenic strain was persistent or detectable was 22 uh, weeks. So we think that as the microbiota recovers in these patients on its own, that it eventually forces out this foreign uh, occupant, namely uh, C. diff, and causes it to uh, be forced out of the stool. And at that point, the normal microbiota should be, again, protective for that patient. Mm. Uh, again, it, I mean, you're still describing other <clears throat> attributes that make it the perfect product. It's non-toxigenic. It persists for a period of time that establishes, allows normal flora to be reestablished, and then it goes away again. I mean, regulators would look at that and they would think that we, this is ideal for, for, from a regulatory perspective, right? 
hard to hard for me to predict what regulators will will say, but uh, uh, I, I believe it is an ideal product for this purpose. And and as we're talking about the ideal product and and its competitors, then there are other products in development. Um, uh, your presentation at the C Diff Society talked about oligofructose, which is not currently being developed and, and has its safety issues. There are other competitors that are complex mixtures of, of uh, bacteria, uh, isolated firm FMTs, and even smaller numbers of uh, consortia, but they don't have the advantages that we've just talked about uh, for, for M3, but they also, they're not a single product, which I, which I, would, I would assume from a manufacturing perspective is much easier to, to, to make and, and reproduce, right? Yeah, I would agree. Uh, there are a, a number of uh, fecal microbiota products that are derived from uh, human donors. Uh, they donate the stool product and the product is then processed and, and used in fecal microbiota transplants. Uh, some of those products uh, have been treated with alcohol to remove uh, most of the uh, live or vegetative bacteria that are present, leaving only the spores, mm. but there's still about 50 different uh, sporulating bacteria in these products. Uh, the uh, alternative would be to manufacture these uh, organisms in the laboratory under good manufacturing practice. And that's also being done. And it, uh, products are being developed that contain eight or more mm. um, different spore forming bacteria that are part of the normal microbiota uh, that can be used more safely because uh, the chance of contamination uh, by some other pathogen from the donor uh, can be eliminated if you manufacture the organism in a laboratory. But it's a much more complex process uh, given that you have eight or more or different organisms that you have to manufacture and put together into a, a consortium of bacteria. And in the same way as you, you previously mentioned in the, the answer just now, you can show that strain M3 um, persists for a short period to establish normal flora and then goes away again, effectively being unde undetected. If even if you had a consortium that was five strains, you'd have to measure those five strains over that same period, which is a lot more technically difficult to, to prove, at least to a regulator's uh, satisfaction, I guess. Right. I, I would think it, uh, it would be considerably more difficult. The more strains you have, obviously, the more complicated it is to do the manufacturing and the more complicated it is to do the documentation that the strains are actually uh, occupying or colonizing the gut. And, and with the competitors that are based on FMTs, uh, mm -hmm. I guess you never can tell. I mean, you have to trust your, your fecal donor, right? But you can never can tell whether there's a toxigenic E. coli in there or something else in there that, that would give the patient perhaps a similar disease or a different disease to the one you're trying to cure. Yeah, that would be the problem of using a uh, donor product uh, and and transfer transmitting it to a recipient. And in fact, the FDA has issued warnings in the last couple of years about transmission of both multi-drug resistant organisms and also uh, toxigenic and, and pathogenic strains of E. coli uh, that have caused infection in the in the uh, recipient of those transplants. Mm. Okay. So thanks for all that background, Professor Gerding. Well, we've had another number of questions and I'll sort of uh, start reading those out now. The first one, um, I don't know the answer to, why do some patients with a first CDI recur and some don't? I think that we don't know the complete answer to that, but we know uh, that there are both patient factors and there are organism factors. Uh, for example, the uh, 027 epidemic strain that we talked about earlier is clearly one that causes high rates of recurrence in patients. It's higher than other strains. Uh, in addition, the host is a very important factor in terms of recurrence. So we know that if you've had a previous recurrence, you're much more likely to have another recurrence. 
that's pretty clear. We know that if you're over the age of 65, your chance of recurrence is much greater. We know that if you're immunocompromised, uh, that also will increase your recurrence. And we know that if you have what's called severe C. diff infection, uh, where your white blood cell count is abnormal or your renal function starts to fail, that there will be a much higher rate of recurrence in that group as well. So, so we have some clues from the uh, patients themselves, and we have clues from the type of bacteria that's causing the infection uh, that, that do give us a bit of an opportunity to predict recurrence. But overall, uh, young people can get recurrences uh, just as well as older ones. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anyone who is completely protected from having recurrence. Right. Thanks for that. Uh, so the next question is, is the C. difficile toxin only directed against humans or does it have a broader antimicrobial effect on the gut my microbiome that then disrupts the gut microbiome, I assume, protective effect? Well, that's, that's a good question. And uh, we think that the primary effect of the toxins is on, uh, on human uh, mucosal cells, uh, the epithelium of the gut, and that, that it disrupts the normal architecture or framework of those cells, causing them to shrink up or, or uh, uh, change their their uh, their uh, conformation so that the tight junctions between the cells open up and that's when the fluid starts to leak out, which is responsible for the diarrhea. But in addition, these toxins are highly inflammatory and cause marked influx of polymorphonuclear leukocytes or white blood cells into the gut. Um, it's almost uh, when you look at them on a microscope like a volcano erupting in the wall of the colon. And um, so they do have very marked toxigenic effects, but I'm, I'm not clear about whether they would also have toxigenic effects against other bacteria. Um, I think that would need further study to determine that. But recently published data suggests that um, the combination of endotoxin, which is present in the stool from gram-negative bacteria, uh, coupled with uh, toxins from C. diff, uh, may together be functioning in a uh, complementary manner to increase uh, inflammation in the gut. Mm. And when I first heard the phrase CDIs, uh, Clostridioides difficile infections, I did think that was a bit of a misnomer because it's not a systemic infection, is it? I mean, the, the, the C. Diff, diff toxin doesn't have systemic effects. It's only in, but, uh, only in the lower bowel. But then I guess if you have more fulminant disease, then, then you have endotoxin and toxin uh, um, re being released from the gut. And that then would have a systemic effect. Well, I think that's that's true. At least in the animal model, we we, uh, we think uh, there there is systemic toxicity that occurs uh, in humans. That's much more unusual and difficult to detect, and it's present if 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 it does occur in very low now, mm -hmm. um, amounts in the blood. And in animals, it has been detected in the blood. In humans, it, it uh, is very infrequent and probably occurs only in the most severe patients uh, who are actually uh, undergoing shock uh, from C. diff infection. And it, it, am I still too old a, a microbiologist to think that you know, most of us have toxigenic C. difficile spores in the microbiome of our, our lower bowel, but the numbers are so small and the microbiome is so protective that they never get to cause disease. Yeah, I think that our current thinking is that there actually are no C. diff in the colon of normal people. Oh, right. That, that if you sample community populations in the West, at least, maybe. 2% will have C. diff detectable in the stool. Um, we think primarily the, the problem is one of disrupting your microbiota by usually antibiotics, and then ingesting the spores of C. diff, which are pretty common in the environment, common in the soil, common in water, 
common even in, in some foods, uh, especially um, uh, root vegetables and even leafy vegetables, and in some meat products as well. Uh, and so we're probably exposed to spores of C. diff almost on a daily basis, but we don't, we aren't harmed by that in any way, uh, simply because our microbiota prevents the C. diff from establishing itself in the gut. It's just when you get this combination of um, antibiotic therapy or an equivalent treatment plus exposure to the spores that you end up with disease. Okay. I think we've got time for about three questions now. I'll, uh, I'll read this one out. So Ceres, which is a competitor to, uh, to Destiny Pharma, often quotes the FDA's, and it's in this <coughs> like of uh, FMTs. Why is it? Is it because it's such an undefined nature or an unregulated product? Um, uh, why does the FDA seem to dislike uh, FMTs? Well, I don't, I don't know what the FDA uh, thinks about FMT, but um, I, I suspect that they're concerned because this is a product that's being used for treatment of patients that has never undergone FDA formal approval. Right. Now, there are companies who are in the process of achieving that FDA approval, and I think they eventually will uh, receive it. Uh, but in the meantime, FDA is in a difficult position of allowing fecal transplants to occur under, uh, under a discretionary policy that they have right now. And I think they would welcome the opportunity to approve a product that had gone through appropriate safety and efficacy trials. Uh, and I think that's coming at, at some future date. Yeah, and there's no reason why M3 shouldn't be top dead center of, of that action because um, if it's a single strain, you know, uh, it has some advantages over whatever is being produced in the FMT space. Well, it, it, it's a single strain, as you, as you point out, and it, it actually acts differently uh, than the microbiota restoration products do in that it uh, is really a replacement for the toxic strain that's present in the gut. And if you can replace it with this strain, you can keep out the toxic, toxic strain. And as a result, you can protect the patient from further recurrence. Right. So our penultimate question is, is the C. difficile toxin transmissible between strains? So could M3 reacquire it? Um, this has actually been shown uh, by Professor Mullaney in London in the laboratory. He was able to take a non-toxigenic strain in his laboratory and a toxigenic strain and do filter mating experiments and show that the entire pathogenicity locus, which contains toxin A and B uh, and their supporting genes, but could be transmitted into this non-toxigenic strain. And we were concerned about that with M3. And so we uh, got the strains that Professor Mullaney used in our laboratory and showed that we could demonstrate the same transfer in the laboratory using his strains. And then we sub, uh, substituted the M3 strain for the recipient's non-toxigenic strain that he used. And we've been unable to document any transfers to the M3 strain. It's, um, it's an in vitro experiment and uh, it's, it's always difficult to say that this will never occur, but it, it does uh, suggest that it's much more difficult to transfer uh, the pathogenicity locus or toxin producing genes into the M3 strain. A second further demonstration that, that has not occurred is that this actually can be accomplished in vivo in the gut itself. And that of course uh, has never been shown. Uh, and it would require, because of the very low rate of transmission, a very high concentration of toxigenic and non-toxigenic strains, both at the same time in the gut for it to occur at all. Right. So uh, speaking on behalf of uh, global pharmaceutical regulators, which I'm not authorized to talk about, that should give them a lot of comfort, I, I guess. In, 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 you know, you, you've done as much as you can in, to show that the, 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 the toxin uh, gene encoding toxins can't be transmitted to, to M3 strain. I hope so. Um, 
Okay, this last question, uh, if you don't mind, Professor Gerding, I'll attempt to answer in the first instance, uh, because it, it, it says, uh, well, the question is, can you comment on the relative value of other CDI stocks and Destiny Pharma in terms of the valuation? I guess the questioner is, is quite right. Competitors to Destiny Pharma are US based. Um, and they have market caps or last round private valuations that are orders above Destiny Pharma. So getting to the crux of that question, the answer is, why is this, this a valuation discrepancy? And, and I would say it's because Destiny Pharma is lin listed on London's uh, AIM exchange, uh, and it's never going to have the profile of a uh, or access to US vest investor base or its capital than a US based company. Uh, that's always going to be a, a, a transatlantic difference in valuation that we've seen you know, since 2000, ever since I became an, an investor. Um, and, and it's probably then more marked uh, when you realise uh, that Destiny Pharma has not just one, but it's got two face ready, ready products. Uh, in my investment research, uh, which is available on our equity development website, I've looked at microbiome competitors like Finch and Ceres. Uh, and while their products are close to the stage of development of Destiny Farmers M3 strain, in terms of efficacy and safety, they, they, they don't look as good apart from one competitor and in one respect. And that was a dosing advantage for, for one competitors. Now, getting back to the, the crux of the presentation or, or, or our, our call today, in your recent pres presentation at the CDFSL conference, Professor Gurney, you talked through a slide on the safety, a comparison of safety of the various competitors and the efficacy of the competitors. And am I right in assuming that Destiny Farmers M3 product looks uh, is 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 reasonably good, quite good in in both those cases? I think it is, and uh, I think to go back to your original question about uh, why uh, it isn't. Uh, more well-known or popular, I think uh, it has been, uh, as we say, flying under the radar mm. for some time in that uh, development, uh, which initiated with one company was interrupted by sale of the company. And, uh, and then I had to recover the technology and relicense. And I think that's, that's all been part of the a process that has really uh, delayed publication of a lot of new data and information about it that that could have progressed uh, more yeah. rapidly. But um, I, I have to defer to you as to uh, the popularity of UK versus US yeah. Uh, companies. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's a burden we live with, and in terms of the development of Destiny Pharma history uh, of M 3s history, I guess they say third time's a charm, right? Okay. So uh, we're coming towards the end of our, our time today. Uh, so on behalf of Equity Development and Destiny Pharma, I'd like to thank Professor Gerding for his contribution and hope that today's and subsequent viewer audiences will appreciate his insight into CDIs and the discovery of M3 and the advantages of, of a non-toxigenic Clostridioides difficile strain M3 and the potential treatment of CDIs. So uh, on behalf of everyone watching and listening, thank you, Professor Gerding. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Goodbye. Bye.